Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. But Brian had asked me to talk about things that were updated at ID Week, and there isn't a lot at ID Week for HIV that's new. It's a lot of updates of studies that have already been presented. So I thought, given the timing of ID Week and the FDA approval, that we'd just review, re-review some data that Brian's already presented on TAF for PrEP and talk about updates from IAS and also from ID Week on uh, the data and talk about what the FDA approval is actually limited to. Um, so first, I don't have any conflicts. So the release came out on October 3rd. So now we have two drugs, Truvada and Descov-V, uh, that are FDA approved for prevention of HIV. I wanted to start the talk off by asking you a polling question about how you plan, how this approval will potentially change your practice. So. Are you an early adopter in that you plan to prescribe uh, FTAF for PrEP for all your patients at risk? Are you even going to go further and change people who are on FTDF to FTAF for PrEP for all your patients at risk? Are you going to do one and two? Are you going to plan? Are you planning to prescribe FTAF for um, MSM and trans women only? Or are you going to prescribe it for MSM trans women with baseline renal insufficiency? Or are you not an early adopter and you do not plan to use FTAF yet? Oh, wow. Great. <laughs> I love it when it's split and there's not a clear answer. So this is really great. So some of you are really early adopters. Uh, no one plans to, oh, well, some people plan to switch their patients currently on FTDF to FTAF. And so we'll kind of go through what the data are supporting FTAF for PrEP and what the FDA approval was actually limited to. Great. Okay, so some background here. Um, this is data that Brian actually presented previously. Uh, some background on why this trial was done is because it wasn't a given that FTAF would work. Similar to FTDF, there was a concern about whether there were potentially lower levels in rectal, rectal and cervicovaginal tissues. So it wasn't a you know, blanket assumption that this would work similar to TDF. But we do know that from studies with people with HIV that there are lower, uh, obviously lower plasma levels of the active metabolite tenofovir that led to potentially reduced renal and bone toxicity over time compared to TDF. So these are slides that a courtesy of Brian that was that were presented before. So Discover, just to give you the background, is a phase three um, multinational double-blind trial that is looking at FTAF versus FTDF for PrEP. And um, of importance is that they enrolled high-risk MSM, cisgender MSM, and transgender women. There were not uh, women, uh, you know, non-trans women in the study. Exclusions, uh, important to note, people with an EGFR less than 60 were excluded, and then if obviously if you had HIV, but also if you had had Hep B in co or Hep B infection. They all received the standard counseling and condoms and every three month visits, and obviously the uh, endpoints were incident HIV. And they had many patients enroll, over 5,000 patients, equally split into the TDF versus TAF arm. So just some baseline demographics here. Some had already been on TDF um, for PrEP at baseline, so about 15, 16-17% that were randomized. So some people who were on TDF did switch to TAF, so we have some data more recently about that switch and what that led to. But the majority of these individuals enrolled did have condomless anal sex and had uh, STIs, not an insignificant number had STIs prior to enrollment. That was baseline data. So the primary endpoint you can see here, there were seven infections in the TAF arm and 15 infections in the TDF arm, which led to it's the result of that it did meet non-inferiority. 
There was numerically less infections in the TAF arm, but not significant statistically. But this is something to note as well because the makers of this drug would like to tout that um, there are less HIV incident infections with TAF compared to TDF. You can see here, this was the early uh, data that was presented at Cori earlier this year that um, mean change in bone mineral density was more favorable with TAF. So you can see even early on with TA TDF use that there is a decline in medium bone de de mineral density at uh, in the spine and in the hip, as well as some changes in GFR, whether you can say that's clinically significant or not, or, or with not very long follow-up is, un is unclear. But you can see that there were actually a lot of STIs in the study as well in both arms, not particularly different in either arm. So these were some conclusions, thank courtesy of Brian here, that FTAF was non-inferior to TDF for PrEP in high-risk um, cis MSM and transgender women. They are both well tolerated, but there was some favor more favorable characteristics in terms of bone and renal outcomes with TAF. And there was no, their risk behavior really didn't change as a result of PrEP use. So one of the things is that we don't have, a, uh, that there was low event rate, so not a huge number of infections, which was great in um, either arm. And there wa weren't any individuals with baseline renal dysfunction. So for those of you who picked FTAF for for those of those limited to those with renal dysfunction, we actually don't have much data in individuals who are HIV negative. Obviously, that's different for people living with HIV. So the update at IAS, which I don't think was presented here so far, what, there was a, a question uh, posed, well, is TAF actually better than TDF based on the results that were shown here with the seven infections versus 15 infections? Uh, and is there some sort of a pl a pharmacologic plausibility of why that could be? So that was investigated further as a subset study where they measured concentrations of the active drug of tenofovir in PBMCs at week four and also in dried blood spots every 12 weeks to assess adherence. They were already assessing adherence um, through pill counts and self-reported adherence for the, all of the participants, but they actually confirmed that with pharmacologic evidence of adherence. And they m compared each incident HIV case to five matched controls, um, um, matched by treatment arm, date of diagnosis, rectal STI, as well as geography. And they estimated the duration of pr um, protection using historic PK data to simulate concentration levels of the active metabolite for TAF and TDF. So there were no differences in reported adherence or pill count in the entire study. But um, TDF levels, active TDF levels, were six-fold higher in the FTAF arm than in the TDF arm. So that's pretty significant. The percentage of participants with active um, drug levels, or uh, the active metabolite levels, above protective threshold through that study, again, this is the subset of in a study participants who had pharmacologic data, um, drug level data, 98% were above the protective level in FTAF arm versus 68% in the FTDF arm. So potentially explaining the small, uh, the numerical difference in the incident HIV um, numbers is what they're positing. Also, median duration of protection uh, was longer after last dose with FTAF with um, levels above the protective level uh, for 16 days versus 10 days after the last dose of TDF. So again, this is all potential explanations of why we may be seeing less incident HIV in them. So one of the conclusions of the investigators at, um, that presented at IAS was really, is there some potential benefit for FTAF over FTDF if there's poor adherence, um, given that reported adherence doesn't always um, correlate with actual adherence? So if patients are not as great with taking daily TAF, maybe it's more uh, lenient or forgiving. So what about the update at ID Week most recently? And this coincided with the FDA approval, but what they really fleshed out was some of these renal outcomes. And looking specifically at the whole, um, all, the whole Discover cohort, not just a subset, but looking at treatment emergent 
renal adverse effects. And so were there renal adverse effects that led to discontinuation? And then also investigated reported proximal tubular, renal tubulopathy. And they measured the standard measures of, that we usually see in these studies with, which was proteinuria, a urine protein to creatinine ratio, uh, EGFR by cockcroft galt and some markers of proximal tubular uh, function, the beta-2 microglobulin. So these were baseline data, and this is just similar to what was had been previously presented. Again, not a lot of renal disease uh, to begin with, because that was an exclusionary, uh, exclusion criteria if you had an EGFR less than 60. So you can see most of the people had a GFR um, well over 100 and really minimal proteinuria, um, very small percentage, so low single digits, um, and also um, fairly low comorbidities for renal dysfunction, as you can see across the board. Again, most people are pretty young and they're 30, so not a lot of these chronic diseases are apparent in this population. So in terms of renal-specific uh, AEs, you can see that not a huge difference uh, in a study, uh, study drug-related renal AEs in either group, uh, 1% or less than 1%. Um, what they were looking at, which was one of their study endpoints, was proximal renal tubulopathy. There were zero in the FTF arm and only one in the FTDF arm, so one out of, you know, over 2,000 patients is a pretty low incidence rate, I would say. <laughs> Interesting, they also presented the data about elevated protein to creatinine ratio. You can see at baseline, the low, low, relatively no, low number of participants uh, in the FTAF arm as well in the FTDF arm, again, showing that we, they really selected out patients who didn't ha who had baseline renal dysfunction. And you can see no change with FTAF, but you can see that there was emergence of uh, urine protein to creatinine elevation in patients who were randomized to TDF. Again, the absolute numbers, if you look over, is only 45 uh, patients out of that, again, pretty large uh, number of patients in FTDF. So what their conclusions were is that 48 weeks FTAF versus TDF for PrEP was associated with significantly better EGFR and renal biomarkers and numerically fewer renal adverse effects and no proximal renal tubular entry, again, compared to one in the TDF arm. So they, I think they were really stretching here to, to come up with some favorable profiles um, for FTAF versus TDF. So FTAF for PrEP. So in terms of the FDA approval, I wanted to get back to that and highlight some important exclusions. I think Hillary summarized really nicely for a, uh, the AATC the, what actually the FDA approved. And again, it, because of the data from Discover, which is what's leading to the FDA approval and its exclusion of women or people born female, it excludes individuals at risk for HIV from vaginal sex. So it's ad adults and adolescents at sexual risk of acquiring HIV who are MSM or transgender women. So women who are at risk because of vaginal sex are not included. Um, the FDA approval is for daily because that's how um, Discover was the studied, the FTAF was studied in the Discover trial. So there's not recommendation for on demand. However, we know that once something is FDA approved, people can use it whatever way they want. Um, and so I'm not saying that that's something that is excluded. And I'd like Joanne's thoughts about this. But again, that Discover trial did not look at on demand um, with FTAF. Why not women? I wanted to just show the FDA panel votes. So 16 to 2 in favor of Descovy being approved for men and transgender women who have sex with men, but pretty split on, the, uh, on approval for women, 10 versus 8. And so that was why it was not included as a indication for the FDA approval. I wanted to get back to this question and after review of the data, if people would change what they said before. I'm noticing the last one, I'm not an early adopter, has gone down. So I think, I you, con I think you convinced a few folks. <laughs> well, I was, that wasn't my goal, actually. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it's, it's interesting how it will be used. So I think some people have wanted to just say, well, we have a safer, potentially safer option. 
why not use FTAF for everyone? And I think one of the things is that I wanted to highlight, this is adapted from a, a graphic that I found. One important thing is cost, which is not insignificant. TDF, FTDF is going generic soon and will be, I don't know what the cost will be, but I'm assuming it's going to be less than $1,800 a month. And I, FTAF will remain at that same price. So it is interesting to think about it from a population level for our patients, given incident rates of renal toxicity are pretty low. Although, you know, these are not, these are 48 week data and obviously not long term data. So, yeah, I think it'll be interesting how this is going to be utilized. There is definitely a lot of heavy marketing for it. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off. Thank you.